morning. Some of you may already recognize that I'm a little sick, so if I sound like Darth Vader, I apologize. Um, today is the final homily in our, in our series, The Lay Foundations to the Commitment of the Common Good. And before I begin this last homily, I want to acknowledge something that all of you probably know. About half of you likely will have already voted. I understand this, it was just on an article the other day, about half of registered Michigan voters have already voted. So I just want to say, for if that's you, Remember what I wrote in the bulletin, I think it was last week, that even if this particular homily series has not helped form your conscience in order to vote for the common good, it's very important for us to preach this series because it helps us to think critically about how we as Christians approach the common good. So in other words, we still can glean benefit from talking about these topics. As a reminder, the first week of this series, I talked about how as Christians, we need to, we need to vote with a Catholic conscience, or to put it a different way, we need to approach voting with a Christian conscience. We need to have a well-formed conscience to be serious as we deliberate about candidates and positions and what the church teaches. And I also said that not all issues carry the same moral weight, that there are some issues that are more foundational to the common good, which is why this series is preaching about those issues and not every single issue. It's just simply not possible for us to address every single issue. The second week, Deacon Josh preached a homily on the dignity of human life, which is at the core of Catholic social teaching. And in this homily, he, he talked about several different injustices against human life, but specifically mentioned that at the heart of the, the common good is the right to life. That if there is no right to life, no other right matters. And so the last week's homily, Father Joshua sp spoke about the, the dignity of family life and marriage and how the government has a responsibility of protecting and promoting the goods of, of parenting and the goods of family and marriage. Because at, at, in, in a real sense, marriage is at the heart of society. And today I want to speak about what Pope Benedict calls the synthesis and keystone of all fundamental rights and freedoms. And that is the right to religious freedom. The Catechism defines religious freedom as this. Nobody may be forced to act against his convictions, nor is anyone to be restrained from acting in accordance with his conscience in, relig in religious matters, in private or in public, alone or in association with others within due limits. This right is based on the very nature of the human person, whose dignity enables him freely to assent to the divine truth, which transcends the temporal order. In other words, if we're made for divine truth, we must be free to search for that truth and live according to it. And when this right is respected, there is hope for peace in civil society. When this right is violated, not only is human dignity uh, offended, but it actually brings about the conditions for injustice and grave violations of human dignity. And we see this all throughout history. This right to religious freedom is so foundational that, that St. John Paul II called it the, the litmus test for the respect for all other human rights. In other words, you could look at a particular culture in, or society in history and tell how just that society is just looking at how free the people are to pursue divine truth and live according to it. And so at the outset then, we must say for all of its imperfections, the United States of America is the freest country in the history of the world, precisely because it was founded upon the principles of religious freedom. This is really important for us to remember because the religious freedom is really the cornerstone of American public life. And it has always been that way, but unfortunately it is quickly changing. So why is this happening? It's not simply happening because Christians are falling away from their faith and more and more people are kind of like uh, falling into unbelief. It's happening because a different religion is ascending and is being imposed on other people by power of law. And that other religion is called secularism, which is simply living without regard to God. And as we look at this, it's important for us to recognize that there are many people today, including many Christians, who think that secularism is actually neutral. That if we embrace secularism, that we try to have this, this neutral place then all religions will be able to live at peace with each other and will be able to have a robust pluralistic society. That is false. In fact, I want to offer three reasons why that is dangerously false. 
The first is, is that the idea of separation of church and state, the very idea of there being a separation of, of religious power and, and um, uh, political power is itself the invention and the product of ancient and medieval Christianity. This is really important to, to remember. Look at all of the different religions of the history of the world. Have you ever noticed that political power and religious power come together in the same people? Those who have power of the state or those who have power in society also are the religious figures of the society. It's always mixed at the top. Only in Christianity do you see a distinction between the temporal authority and religious authority. And the, the church has a vested interest for this to happen. Where the church does not want the state uh, to corrupt the church in its influence on the church. So they have that distinction. Nor does the church want the, the state to use the church for its own ends. After all, as Christians, we believe that Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God, right? A kingdom that is not of this world. So our allegiance is to the kingdom of God that transcends this world. We are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what is God's, which is everything. And so the first is that, that this ultimately comes from the church itself, that the separation of church and state. But it's not what people think. And that second point is this, is that the original purpose of separation of church and state in our legal kind of jurisprudence here in the United States was not to rid culture of religion. It was not to create this neutral space. It was to prevent the state from establishing a particular religion to impose on everyone else. And that's exactly what's happening today. But the faith that is being imposed is not Christianity. What's interesting to me is that I would say if looking at our history, looking at what's happened the last 50, 60 years, I think the founding fathers would be horrified to see that the very country that was founded on religious freedom is being used in order to, re, re, to get rid of religion from the public square. Third point is that strictly speaking, the secular worldview, and this is very important, is not neutral. Secularism is not neutral, and it does not provide a space for religions to practice their faith freely. Think about it. Secularism has its own theology. God does not exist. There is no purpose. There is no meaning to life. There's nothing that transcends physical matter. Everything is meaningless. It has its own um, anthropology. Look at the, its view of human nature. There's this dualistic view of human nature. Soul and body are, are, are so separate that you can do whatever you want with it, right? There's no inherent rights in, in the secularism to any human person. There's no, there's no um, inherent value to human nature. In fact, the only value and rights that human nature has is what the state declares that it has. In other words, we just have to add that by means of government, government in order to prevent chaos. We also see in secularism a particular um, morality, right? Since there's no real purpose to life, right? Since there's nothing that transcends the temporal order, morality is, is to maximize pleasure and to minimize pain. Hedonism. And so in other words, if hedonism is the way in which decisions are made. And so by definition, secularism rejects transcendent values. It rejects the reality of love. It rejects the reality of righteousness or, or justice. It rejects truth. And by definition, it rejects freedom of religion. This is really important for us to remember. And so the question of God is probably the most important question when it comes to considering human rights. In fact, when it comes to considering a just society, the question of God is the most important question. John Paul II, as late as, or as early as 1995, diagnosed this in his encyclical on culture of life, um, the gospel of life. He says that it is precisely when people reject God that the dignity of the human person is transgressed. This is how he says it. He says, when the sense of God is lost, there is also a tendency to lose the sense of man, of his dignity and his life. We shouldn't be surprised then when God is pushed out of culture, when God is pushed out of politics, when God is pushed out of, of law, that the dignity of the human person begins to be, uh, to be violated, right? When we lose the creator, we lose the dignity of the creature made in his image. This is really important. And so as Christians, looking at how these ideologies have, have their way in culture, we can understand why when atheistic ideologies are at play and are being imposed on other people, that it creates um, all sorts of injustices. And notice 
what happens to human nature when you approach human nature from this godless perspective? Notice this, they try to divide, or people caught up in this, whether knowingly or not, divide what God has united. Right? So there's an attempt to divide body and soul. We see this happening in gender ideology. Right? People can identify whatever they want with because their body doesn't really matter to their true identity. So you, there's an attempt to divide marriage and children in a divorce ideology, right? Um, we see sex and babies, there's this, there's this division there. Sex has nothing to do with babies in a contraceptive ideology, right? We see also like an abortion ideology, like, like a mother can be divided against her child. And so a mother has a right to kill her child. We see also this happening with regard to race. Rather than uniting races in our one common human nature, we see attempt to divide race, which is exactly what this critical theory, critical race theory does and DEI initiatives. And many of you know that I've published uh, why DEI initiatives are fundamentally incompatible with Christianity. And so what happens with all of these things is that when people have a political authority and power, they might be tempted to impose that faith of secularism on the rest of culture. And so when that happens, we see a particular and a familiar pattern, right? So they might start with preaching tolerance, like I'm all for tolerance for diversity, inclusivity, but in the end, they're not tolerant of people who disagree with them. Have you ever noticed that? They're not tolerant of those who have differing ideas. And as a result, they might resort to labeling dissenters hateful, bigoted, racist, People that disagree with their frame of how they understand a social problem are disagreed with and they're labeled. And as a result, they might begin to invent new rights based on a, a, a view of freedom that is against love. It's based on a false anthropology. And they might start inventing rights, like so-called reproductive freedom, or reproductive rights, as if somehow there is a right for a mother to kill an innocent child or as if somehow there's a right for a boy to enter a girl's restroom. And also we, also, we, we can also see that, that people will tend to try to use the state to silence those who disagree with them and to impose onto others, to force onto the others a cooperation with their own moral choices. After all, we get to tell you when, where, and how you practice your faith. I first noticed this tendency back in 2012 when the Affordable Care Act was uh, being released uh, as a way of implementing um, this Affordable Care Act, there was the Health and Human Services mandate, which mandated that people paid for um, objectionable um, in, uh, procedures or practices uh, that, were, that were, they were mandating that coverage to be given to everybody, including religious people. The Little Sisters of the Poor filed a lawsuit against the federal government because they were being forced to provide sterilizations, contraception, and abortion-inducing drugs in their coverage. I remember one bishop at the time, he, he said that it was an unprecedented incursion into freedom of conscience on behalf of the federal government. Along the same time, because the, the bishops were sounding alarm all the way back in 2012, there was this an attempt uh, to reduce freedom of religion to freedom of worship. Think about that. If you're free to pursue religious truth and live accordingly in your whole life, they were, they were attempting to reduce it to just who you worship or where you worship. They were trying to say, you're, you're free to worship God on Sunday, but do not bring your faith into your politics. Do not bring your faith to your workplace. Do not bring your faith into the public square. That was what was happening. Today, whether it's uh, the unjust vaccine mandates to people being forced to subsidize uh, by taxes, abortions, and tra gender transition surgeries, to the threatening of conscience rights of doctors and nurses who don't want to violate their faith, to even now the government seeking to censor free speech, it's not difficult to see that religious freedom is under threat in our country. The Diocese of Lansing General Counsel, that is the bishop's lawyer, had this to say just a few weeks ago, and he published, we published this in the bulletin. This is what he says. Just this year alone, federal agencies have proposed 15 new rules or draft rules advancing a radical agenda of abortion, contraception, sterilization, and gender ideology. And as bad as these rules are, they are far worse for failing to include what used to be standard religious liberty protections. What does someone have to believe about human nature or about reality to not even grant basic human rights of religious freedom? I, just one final point. 
The history of, creation, history of Christianity is filled with violations against religious freedom. We see soft per persecution, which makes it difficult for Christians to practice their faith and may even make it illegal. And we also see total persecution, which ends in the killing of Christians who witness to their faith. Jesus himself can be considered a victim of persecution against the principle of religious freedom. He was a martyr for religious freedom, speaking to us about who he was, who his father was, and calling all of us to repentance so that we might live forever in the kingdom that does not end. It is Jesus who says, if the world hates you, realize that it hated me first. Remember the word I spoke to you, no slave is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. While it's true that God can bring good things out of religious persecution, while he can bring good out of people dying for the faith, a lot of evil things come into civil society when persecution happens. The worst of which is Christians having a difficult time and in their weakness choose no longer to follow Jesus and endanger their eternal salvation. My brothers and sisters, the right to religious freedom is not given to us by the government. It's given to us by God and it's rooted in our human nature. The government has an opportunity, sorry, an obligation to protect this right. And so if you have not voted yet, I want you to consider maybe these questions. Which candidates promote policies that protect the freedom of religion and conscience so that all people are free to seek the truth and live accordingly? Which candidates promote and protect the free exchange of ideas and the freedom of speech so that people can pursue the truth? Which candidates respect people of faith in such a way that they resist using political power to impose secular ideologies onto the people? My brothers and sisters, in the end, Jesus Christ is our king. We belong to his kingdom and his kingdom is not of this world. It is our responsibility as Christians to pray and to work that God's kingdom comes. His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we do that, we leave the results to him.